I think that saying that the Sega Genesis has gained new life would be an understatement. Who could have predicted that now, decades after Sega discontinued its 16-bit console, it would receive so many new games, ports and exclusives? But I can also see how this would be confusing to someone who has not been following these releases. So today, I'm going to rank every major modern Sega Genesis game out there. But first, a few rules. Every game in this list must be completed. So this means no titles that are still in development and only have a demo to show for them. Secondly, it has to be a game that you can legally buy or could legally buy at some point. Additionally, the games also have to feel like something that could have been realistically been launched back in the day. So smaller projects like Fixed Felix will not be counted. And finally, I will also be including games that originally only had limited releases but were re-released recently. So let's get started! At the end of our list we have Generals of the Yank family. This Pico release is not just a bad game, but is also one of the worst beat-em-ups I have ever played. This game was originally launched as a bootleg in Taiwan, and uh, yeah, it's not very good. Graphically it's fine, nothing too impressive, but I've seen worse. But the gameplay is just so stiff, the way your character moves or how they become locked in combo animations always gets to me. The move variety isn't too bad for a 16-bit game, but it feels like there's very little variation between different foes and the music is pretty bad. I get that bootleg developers did not have the same tools as official developers had, but man, this game had no business getting re-released. Avoid this one. Next up, we have Duke Nukem 3D, and sadly, this game is pretty horrible as well. Originally launched exclusively in Brazil, it also received a more recent, wider release courtesy of Pico Interactive. And I'll give it this, seeing a first-person shooter on the Mega Drive is pretty impressive, but the controls leave a lot to be desired, making it very difficult to aim at enemies. The frame rate can also reach the single digits at times, especially during explosions. And the game is just so ugly to look at. I get that porting Duke Nukem 3D to the Sega Mega Drive was always going to be a thankless job, and to be fair, there is an honest attempt at porting the spaceport levels and their layouts to the 16-bit console. Not only that, but all the items are here and the weapons are recognizably Duke Nukem's. And I gotta be honest, mowing down enemies is actually really fun. But this game suffers from one major issue that just kills it. And that's the fact that enemies do not drop ammo when you dispatch them. In fact, there's no way to get extra ammo outside of the few ammo pickups scattered throughout the levels. So I hope that you're really good with that boot there, cause you're gonna need it. And I feel that this is the main issue. Pico Interactive also added crosshairs to the game, something which the original release did not have. And they also increased the turning speed. But what they really should have added was ammo drops. I know some people actually like this version, and more power to them, but I'm not one of them. Poppy Commando Second Blood is a game by Veteya. You play as Poppy and Mommy and your Comostrat computer has been stolen, so now it's up to you to get it back and wreak vengeance. The game is a top-down shooter where each level has a different objective. Basically, you're in this overworld where you can freely travel back and forth and your objectives will range from surviving during a set period of time to defeating a set number of enemies or recovering parts to your Comostrat computer. Along the way, you'll find some temporary power-ups like speed increases or freezing enemies. Poppy can shoot, but your bullets are limited and your ammo count will carry over towards the next levels. You do have a knife as well, but the range of that thing is honestly pathetic. 
Dispatching foes also allows you to collect money, which you can spend at a shop for upgrades. The issue is that I feel these upgrades are priced way too high, and if you lose a life, you also lose any of the gear that you bought. Add to that that the game is kind of ugly, the music isn't particularly great, and just how repetitive the whole thing is, and I just can't really recommend this one. This game is just not for me. Coffee Crisis is one of the earlier modern Genesis releases. I remember there being a lot of publicity for this one, but when the game was finally out, the reception ranged from negative to middling, and playing it now for the first time, I'm inclined to agree. You play as Tuberistas fighting off an alien invasion, and I gotta admit, I kinda dig the premise. And while the backgrounds are just static images with no animation or even parallax scrolling, I do have to admit the characters themselves are nicely animated. But unfortunately, the game is just not very good. The hit detection feels extremely loose, and enemies will often stick a few punches in while you're still hitting them. To make matters worse, your move variety is extremely limited. You have your basic combo, and you can perform a jump attack, and uh, that's it, you don't even have a running attack. You do get some weapon pickups, which are fun to use, but again, the hit detection still feels weird on these. You have cutscenes between levels to provide some context, though honestly, the story isn't all that interesting to begin with, but at least these can be skipped. And finally, we have the soundtrack, which seems to be entirely comprised of those harsh Mega Drive sounds that no one actually likes. I feel this game sits right at the edge between bad and okay, but I would still avoid this one. Gluff is a puzzle platformer released by... Mega Cat. Damn, that's a cool logo. You control this frog thing and you need to recharge at these battery locations. And once charged, you have to walk over each individual floor piece. You'll know which pieces you've been to because they change color as you walk over them. And you need to do this while avoiding being hit by enemies. And uh, that's it, that's the game. You have no means of self-defense and the game gets progressively harder with new enemy types or platforms that disappear once you walk over them. But uh, yeah, this game is super simple. I actually finished the game in under 20 minutes the first time I played it. I feel like there's potential here, but the game is just too short and simple. And for some reason the music is... Loituma Polka? Yeah, remember when that was a thing? But yeah, this game needs another variable or two to make it more complex. Overall, not a bad game, but not particularly great either. Devil 2 is a platformer by Mangaga Team. This is a pretty basic game that has you going from screen to screen, jumping on enemies and on platforms. You'll often run into these ancient Egyptian style enemies, though I find their hit detection pretty questionable. And you cannot progress until you've dispatched them. But boy, the game really loves throwing these guys at you any chance it gets. To be honest, I struggle to find things to talk about with this game because it's so basic. It's not a bad game, but it definitely feels like a hobbyist title instead of something that you would see back in the day. I've heard the team behind this game are actually pretty cool dudes, and out of all their titles, I chose the one that seemed the most complete, as the rest have production values that definitely lean even harder on the hobbyist side from what I've seen. Not a bad game, but you can do better. La Baie des Morts, or The Abbey of the Dead, is a 16-bit remake of a modern ZX Spectrum game. 
you play as a monk who's escaping persecution and you find yourself trapped in a church which seems to be crawling with demons. One cool thing about this game is that you can switch between graphical styles in the options menu. So you can choose between the Mega Drive visuals, but you can also select the original ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, MSX, Game Boy and even CGA graphics. The level design will also slightly change depending on which version you're playing. Though the soundtrack remains the same for every version except the Commodore 64, which the Mega Drive sound chip seems to emulate to some degree of accuracy. The game is reminiscent of a lot of early Euro platformer collectathons like Jet Set Willy, and your enjoyment will largely depend on whether or not you're into that. This means that you have to collect several items in an entirely non-linear fashion and if you already know where everything is, you can most likely finish the game in just 15 minutes. But of course, this genre was known for its extreme difficulty and La Baie des Morts is no exception. For one thing, you have zero means of self-defense, so this means that you'll spend all your time avoiding enemies when possible. Now, I actually quite like this game. But I also know that this is a very niche title, even by modern Mega Drive standards. So even though I really dig this one, I can't in all conscience rate this one any higher than this, because I know that unless you grew up with the 8-bit microcomputer craze in Europe, there's a very good chance that this one is just not your cup of tea. From one Euro platformer to another, this is Switchblade. Switchblade began life as an Atari ST game in the late 80s and early 90s before being ported to a slew of 8-bit computers. And while this is yet another Euro platformer like La Baie des Morts, it plays very differently. For one thing, you actually have a means of self-defense in the form of kicks, punches and weapon pickups. And even though the game is still non-linear, it's not a collectathon. Instead, you need to defeat a boss to unlock the next portion of the base to explore. With that said, yeah, this game takes place entirely in this grey, dull looking base with the same theme song running in the background, so it gets rather dull. The boss fights also rely entirely on you finding at least one weapon and having enough ammo to take it down. If you've spent them all before fighting that area's boss, you might as well restart the game. Other than that though, I quite like this game, though it falls under the same caveat as La Baie des Morts, that being that this genre is a bit of an acquired taste. I should also point out that this game has some compatibility issues with a specific variation of the PAL Model 1 Mega Drive model, including the only Mega Drive model that I actually own. The developer has addressed this problem and issued a fix, but if you are buying this game, you should most likely ask the seller if this is a fixed version or not. Beggar Prince is an RPG originally released in Taiwan before being translated and receiving a modern release by Super Fighter Team. You are the prince of the what kingdom? <laughs> oh, this is amazing. And you're a spoiled brat who wants to go out and have some fun. So you are introduced to a pauper who bears an uncanny resemblance to you and the two trade places. Except you eventually realize you now have no way of getting back home. So you set out on a quest to reclaim the lost treasures of your kingdom as a means of proving your real identity. This is a very by the numbers RPG for the time. Visually it's not bad, though the story does little for me and the music even less. Overall though, this game's not bad. Metal Dragon is a top-down shooter in the vein of Commando or Shock Troopers. 
The game is also interspersed with these Metal Gear Solid style cutscenes, though the dialogue is clearly meant to be tongue in cheek. A little too tongue in cheek, if I'm honest. I chuckled the first couple of levels, but the game tries way too hard to be funny and the style of humor gets really old really fast. It mostly seems to rely on innuendos or referential humor where the reference is the joke. By the end of it, I was pretty sick of the main character. The gameplay does fare better though. It's quite fun to run around and mowing down enemies and the music is honestly great. Unfortunately though, much like the humor, the gameplay also gets repetitive. For one thing, there's little to no enemy variety, as they all essentially act or behave too similarly. You also have a limited range of weapon pickups and they don't feel different enough between them. You don't really notice this the first level or two, but towards the latter half, the repetition will really start dragging this game down. I also discovered that this game is actually easier if you don't shoot anyone and just keep walking forward. Oh no! Someone just put a massive tank in front of me! Wouldn't it be a shame if I could just walk past it without any reason? There we go! Oh no! Another massive tank in front of me! Wouldn't it be a shame if I could just sit behind this car and let the tank destroy itself without me having to do anything? Yep. This game had potential to be so much more, but a lot of it feels wasted. FX Unit Yuki is a modern action platformer originally released for the TurboGrafx-16 and PC Engine, though it would receive a Mega Drive port a year later. You play as an anime girl wearing a PC Engine inspired armor as she jumps into popular PC Engine games to fix any bugs they might have. Along the way, she'll also meet her rival Jenny, and her armor is styled after that sleek black gaming machine. That's right, the ZX Spectrum. The levels are styled after popular PC Engine games like New Adventure Island and Castlevania. And as you progress through the game, you'll unlock new permanent abilities like a slide move and a double jump. You also have a few shmup levels, though I have to admit I wasn't big on these, as they felt a little too basic. But the platforming levels were pretty fun. With all of that said though, I feel the Mega Drive version is inferior to the original PC Engine release. You can definitely tell the colors took a hit, especially during cutscenes. And to be fair, the original PC Engine version also had wonky colors during these, but it's so much worse here. Still, it's a pretty fun game, but I would go with the PC Engine version instead. Canon is another RPG that originally began life as a bootleg in Taiwan, though this one, in my opinion, fares much better than the Beggar Prince. This is a tactical turn-based RPG in the style of Shining Force, though the plot is now based on Chinese mythology. So far, so good, but the game seems to assume that you're already somewhat familiar with the subject matter at hand, because I had a hard time following what was going on. Between missions, you have a status screen where you select your party as well as gear and items for each character, though sadly, you can only take 5 characters with you to each battle. My biggest issue with this game is that towards the end, the game becomes artificially harder, because it's now constantly spawning new enemies as soon as you dispatch old ones. At least you get to keep all the experience and items gained even if you get a game over. And the strategic side of the game is also not as well developed as something like Shining Force, as I feel that there's not a whole lot that separates each hero stat-wise or ability-wise, so they all just kind of end up blending together. But despite these issues, I still enjoyed the game. The Crow Maiden is a thinking man's action platformer, I guess. 
You play as Ira, a priestess who needs to rescue her fellow barbarians who were kidnapped by an evil tribe. Ira's movement is slow, stiff and methodical, meaning that you need to think on the best way to progress before you actually do it. And throughout your journey, you'll collect health items and weapon upgrades. Being hit by an enemy, however, will reduce the level of your sword. This means that some enemies will take as many as 4 hits to bring down if you're at your lowest level, which can be a problem during boss fights, as some of these took a lot of hits when I was down to my lowest level. After defeating a boss, you'll earn an upgrade which can come in the form of either permanent health boosts or new abilities for your crow. So at first, you can use your crow as a ranged attack, but later you'll also learn abilities like this gliding maneuver that let you reach farther ledges. I like these new abilities, but I don't think they're spaced correctly. You need to beat 6 levels and fight 2 bosses just to get your first ability, as the first boss gives you a health upgrade instead. The issue is that the levels become more interesting the more abilities you have, so the first 6 levels are just kinda there. I think the game would have been better paced if every boss gave you an ability and if you collected health upgrades during the regular levels instead. Additionally, I do feel the graphics are a little simple, but I really dig the music. There's also an NES version which plays mostly the same, except Ira now moves faster, and I feel this greatly works towards the game's benefit. For this reason, I think the NES version is the one to get, but this is still pretty good. Pure Solar is an RPG by Watermelon. This was the game that arguably kickstarted this new wave of modern game development on the Mega Drive. You play as Hostin, a young botanist looking for a rare herb to heal your sick father. Once you find the herb, however, you realize there's more at stake with an ancient lost civilization whose technology seems to have become active and other parties who are interested in it. The combat is turn-based and it even features a focus mechanic which works similarly to what we see in Octopath Traveler, except this game predates Octopath by quite a few years. So Pure Solar is pretty forward-thinking in that regard. The combat is pretty fun at first, but as you progress, some issues become apparent, like how melee characters cannot attack flying enemies, meaning that half your party becomes mostly useless for a lot of random battles, and this becomes really grating. Additionally, status elements in this game are way too punishing. I also feel the focus mechanic, while useful, can drag the pacing down quite a bit, as it's not as well thought out as something like Octopath Traveler, requiring you to skip several turns until it becomes actually useful for that fight. Additionally, you'll often reach points where you have to do something to progress the story, but the game is not clear on where you need to go or what you need to do. Like for example, one of your party members runs away and the characters say that they should ask around if someone's seen her. So I ask around and all anyone says is that they don't know where she is. So I go to the surrounding areas and no one even mentions her. So I assume that she's hiding somewhere in town. But no, turns out you have to catch a boat and go to a city in a different continent. Except I never saw anyone even mention her throughout my journey there. But the story would also not progress until I found her. I respect the game for what it achieved, and to be fair, it's not a bad game at all, but some of these issues do drag the pacing down a bit. Arcadius Revolution is a Mode 7 like top down shooter. The fact that a game like this exists at all is honestly impressive for the system it's running on. Of course, it does come with some pretty major caveats, namely how you're limited to just one third of the screen, which can make your field of view pretty claustrophobic. 
Despite this, the game will still experience some slowdown when a lot of action is happening on screen at the same time. But outside of those rare few instances, the game will run at 60 frames per second. Anyway, your planet is being taken over and you are a resistance fighter opposing the group. The game has a few cutscenes, though honestly, the art style looks pretty goofy. The game also features an impressive amount of voice recordings. It's the first time it'll be in you. I'm tested. Roger. The only other Mega Drive game I can think of to feature this much dialogue is Strider Returns. Never, my friend. Tomorrow is the day you die. Except Arcade's Revolution is the clearly better game. I quite like how smooth the gameplay is, and you even get a few weapon pickups which you'll be able to cycle through at your discretion. Not only that, but any weapon you pick up can be upgraded, which is pretty cool. Unfortunately, the game forces you to play through multiple tutorial areas, which I'm not a big fan of. And I do feel that the overall experience is a bit too short, a bit too easy, and that there isn't enough weapon variety. But I still had fun with this game, and I think it's worth checking out. Hey folks, so turns out I caught the flu between recording sessions, so I apologize for my voice. Anyway, let's keep going. Life on Mars Genesis is a Metroidvania launched a few months ago by the same developer behind Metal Dragon. I should point out that this is a 16-bit remake of a modern MSX game which was also created by the same developer. You're a soldier sent to investigate a space station when you learn that everyone is gone and the security robots are all targeting you. The dialogue here isn't perfect, but it's leaps and bounds better than Metal Dragon, featuring far less needless swearing, though it still has some. One thing that I really struggle to adjust to are your stiff controls. If you go into this one expecting Metroid or Castlevania, you will be disappointed, because these controls are stiff. As you explore the station, you'll acquire new abilities that help you reach new areas, though these often feel a little disappointing. Usually, it's stuff like a sprinting maneuver or the most disappointing grenade launcher you'll ever fire in your life. And instead of using ammo, your weapons drain energy, meaning that you can usually fire between 2-4 to four shots before you have to wait for your energy to recharge. As you dispatch enemies, you can buy energy or weapon upgrades. But be warned, upgrading your weapons also makes them drain more energy. So in a way, you're trading firepower for rate of fire. Meaning that after upgrading your weapon, you'll have to grind yet again to upgrade your energy and increase that rate of fire yet again. But to do all of this, you have to go to specific upgrade stations, as each one only upgrades one individual item. So you'll have to run back and forth between the game to get your character's stats to where you want them to be. And honestly, this feels like a level up system with extra steps. The game is also rather small, I mean, what you're seeing now is the full game map and in fact, I finished the game in roughly 3 hours and that's after I explored an entirely optional area for the upgrades. Overall, I like this game, but it's too short and bare bones. It basically suffers from the same issue as Metal Dragon, in that it has a lot of potential, but it feels a little bit squandered. Still, check it out if you like what you see. Mad Stalker is a beat-em-up that was originally launched for the Sharp X68000 and the PC Engine. A Mega Drive version was also planned, though it was cancelled only to be released in 2020. And I feel that this is the weakest version of the game, featuring a graphical downgrade when compared to the Sharp X68000 version, but is also missing some content found in the PC Engine version. Namely, how the PC Engine version lets you choose between different Macs, but here you only get one. Unless to play in the versus mode. If you do that, then you can select the others. Anyway, this is a beat em up that controls like a fighting game, meaning that you need to use Street Fighter like combinations to use your different abilities. Though thankfully, they are all easy to pull off. 
The first time I reviewed this game, I wasn't that crazy about it. But I have since softened my opinion on this game somewhat. The game is super fun when you're fighting against regular enemies and pulling all the different combos and moves that you can. But then you have the smaller enemies which require you to spam the same move over and over again which always drag down my enjoyment. But my biggest issue with this game have always been the bosses. They are so cheap. So, so cheap. I mean look at this, I'm now stuck in a damage animation loop meaning that I cannot move so I just need to sit there and wait until the game decides that I can control my character again. Because of this, I found that the best way to defeat the bosses is to be cheap yourself. Some people really love this game and while I have softened a little bit on it, I'm not that big of a fan. Water Margin is a beat'em up that was originally launched as a bootleg game before once again receiving a modern release. At first glance, this one may look a lot like Generals of the Yang family, but it's better in a lot of ways. For one thing, the graphics and art style are much more appealing, taking some pretty obvious cues from Capcom's Knights of the Round. The controls are also not nearly as stiff as Generals of the Yang family, and the enemy variety is way better, with different types of soldiers having completely different behaviors and attacks. You've also got a cool move that essentially punches enemies off screen which is a great tool for crowd control and it's also really fun to use it during a boss fight. Along the way you'll also pick up magic items which function similarly to the potions in Golden Axe or the police icons in Streets of Rage. Honestly, this game may have began life as a bootleg title, but it's way better than you might think and I would honestly play this over several official beat'em ups on the Genesis. I say check this one out. The Curse of Vilmore Bay is a platformer by the same developer behind Ira the Crow Maiden, but I feel this is a much better game. For one thing, your character moves a lot faster, giving it a better pacing. Anyway, an evil genie casts the curse on the town of Vilmore and now it's up to you to turn it back. You do this by going to each stage, find the key and then reach the exit. After doing this for 3 stages, you'll fight a boss who rewards you with a new ability upon defeating them and you can cycle between abilities by hitting the pause button. The cool thing is that as you unlock new abilities, you can revisit old levels, find secret keys on hidden paths which in turn lead to upgrades to the abilities you already acquired. And I really dig that. I do feel that your magic bar depletes way too fast and filling it back up is much more difficult than it should be. But overall, yeah, this is actually a really fun game. Tanglewood is a puzzle platformer in the style of games like Limbo. You play as a fox and you have to drag these cute little guys into their nests and depending on their color they'll give you abilities like floating or slowing down time. And as you progress through the game, you'll also find a second fox whom you need to give some basic instructions as well. The graphics are quite minimal and the music is sparse, going more for mood instead of catchy tunes. And I quite like how this game will often verge on horror, as you feel helpless throughout the game and you are constantly beset by creatures big and small that can easily do you in. There really isn't any other game like this on the Mega Drive and I think it's very much worth checking out.
The Cursed Knight is part action platformer and part shmup. This game honestly creates a terrible first impression, with the first level being pretty slow and the second stage feeling like little more than a tutorial area. But once things get going, the level design becomes exponentially better. You have the ability to reverse gravity, which allows for some pretty fun and interesting platforming sections. Not only that, but you'll also find permanent upgrades if you're willing to veer off the beaten path. Interspersed with these, you'll have shmup levels. And at first, you'll only have two weapons which you can cycle at will, with a third weapon that you can pick up at a later date. The game is pretty fun and some of these backgrounds honestly look incredible. And you'll often run into set pieces that, while not amazing, do help spice up the gameplay. Unfortunately though, the game never really finds itself until you reach this area which is like 20 minutes in. From this point on, it becomes immensely more interesting. But man, those first few levels are just so boring. The developers did state that, after watching my review on it, they were gonna work on these issues and remake the first two levels. So I don't know if this was updated or not, but if it was, let me know in the comments. Jim Power The Lost Dimension is the year of running gun released by Pico Interactive. If you're familiar with the Super Nintendo game, then you'll most likely know what to expect with this one. Originally, there was also a Sega version planned before being cancelled, but Pico bought the rights to the game and released an advanced prototype that hadn't been dumped before. This is the sort of game that requires you to memorize the levels as most enemies give you very little time to react. Not only that, but you cannot run and shoot at the same time. Instead, shooting makes you stationary. Between stages, you'll also have several shmup levels and my god, these are impossibly difficult. You really need to memorize your way through this game. Thankfully, the Sega version grants you an extra hit point per life that is not included in the Super Nintendo version. But even with that, this game is super difficult. The music is pretty good, being composed by the legendary Chris Hulsbeck, though I do feel the music was better on the Super Nintendo. The graphics are also insanely good, with giant sprites and tons of parallax scrolling. In fact, maybe too much parallax scrolling, as it can be quite hard for my brain to sift through all the flashy visuals and just focus on the game. But despite that, I really love every version of this game I've ever played, and this one is worth checking out. Brave Battle Saga is another RPG that originally began as a bootleg game, before receiving a modern release. This is a game that wears its Final Fantasy and Breath of Fire inspiration on its sleeve. The story and characters are a little basic, but overall they're pretty easy to follow and it's a fun game to grind. And honestly, the best characters in the game are the computerized versions of Albert Einstein and Thomas Edison. And every character can learn every magical ability. But still, it's pretty clear the developers were not used to RPG development, as the game often forgets or solves plot points as soon as they're raised, while other times it gives the most obvious plot twists that you can imagine. Like how there's this whole subplot on how the main girl may or may not be human. You mean to tell me the flying demoness with wings may not be human? Nah, no, really? But despite these shortcomings, I really enjoyed this game, and I recommend you give it a try. Demons of Vestaborg is an action platformer with some puzzle elements thrown in. And I gotta say, this is one of the most beautiful Mega Drive games I've ever seen. The production values here are incredible, with smooth animations, great backgrounds and an incredible soundtrack. 
You play as Gareth and demons are invading. And while the story does take a few twists and turns, it's nothing particularly unexpected. I really like the way your character controls and combat is fun for the most part. During each level, you gain an ability like magic shots, reflecting attacks and more. And these will also be used for puzzle solving. But to be honest, I've always felt the puzzles broke the flow of the game. Not helped by the fact that you can only use that ability for that specific level. So in other words, whatever power you gain for that stage will not be available on the next level. Which is a bummer. Another issue I have is that the bosses are super spongy, especially this werewolf boss. Between stages, you can also access a shop to acquire upgrades, though I do feel the prices are a little steep for the number of levels the game has. But still, these are honestly small gripes as the game is truly incredible and creates some amazing visuals for the hardware. Now, before we get to the remaining top 5 games, how about we check out a selection of titles that I think are the most interesting projects, as well as being the most likely to see the light of day as fully completed games. Castlevania Symphony of the Night is a port to the PS1 Classic for the Mega Drive. The game is still in development, and there's no demo that I'm aware of. All I know is that it splits the game into levels, but so far, it's looking very good. Sunset Riders Mega Drive Arcade Edition This is not a hack of the Mega Drive version of Sunset Riders, but instead it's a completely new port built from the ground up that aims to create the definitive 16-bit port of Konami's arcade classic. Phantom Gear is an action platformer which looks great, sounds great and has been in development for nearly 5 years. I've been eagerly awaiting this game for a long time. Affinity Sorrow is a Final Fantasy style JRPG being created by the same studio behind Ira the Pro Maiden and The Curse of Vilmore Bay, and I'm eagerly awaiting this one. Esther Bros is a roguelite action platformer by the same developers behind Demons of Estabor. I got to play a demo of this one and I'm really excited for it. Final Fight Ultimate aims to be the definitive 16-bit port of Capcom's classic brawler, and things are looking very good. BioEvil began as a demake of Resident Evil 1 for the Mega Drive, but the developers have since expanded their project and instead made it into its own original game. A smart move if you ask me. ZPF is a shmup with incredible graphics that seems to be heavily inspired by the likes of Lords of Thunder for the Sega CD and PC Engine CD. Definitely one to watch out for. Irina Genesis Metal Fury is a shmup that had a successful Kickstarter campaign and is currently in development. I actually backed this game on Kickstarter and I'm eagerly awaiting for the day it's ready. Mega Man The Sequel Wars is a fan remake of Mega Man 4, 5 and 6 and is meant to be a sequel to Mega Man The Wily Wars. Crypt of Dracula is a turn-based dungeon explorer game. It's been in development for quite some time, but it seems like it's finally starting to gain shape. Arcagus Escape is a game by the same developer behind Arcagus Revolution. And this time, instead of making it a Mode 7 style game, it's now a full-blown first-person mech game, making this one a far more impressive title if you ask me. Yuzo Koshiro, the composer behind games like Streets of Rage, Revenge of Shinobi and Actraiser, has announced that he's working on a new Mega Drive shmup. The game is currently unnamed. Black Jewel Reborn is an action platformer with a style reminiscent of Conan the Barbarian. The game is currently available for pre-order. R-Type, the classic shmup is finally receiving a port for the Mega Drive. Hopefully it can surpass the already incredible version on the TurboGrafx-16. Alright, that's enough of that. Time for my personal top 5 modern games on the Sega Genesis. Xeno Crisis Xeno Crisis is one of the most well-known modern Genesis games, and with good reason. Just like Demons of Vestaborg, the production values for this one are incredible. Featuring amazing graphics, fantastic music and a high number of enemies on screen. 
put this game next to the official Genesis version of Smash TV and the differences are night and day. You play as a soldier sent to a military base, infested by aliens and shoot at everything in sight. But don't shoot blindly because you'll run out of ammo and you'll have to pick up a new ammo clip that will appear randomly on the ground. You'll also find additional weapons which are fun to use and you even have grenades and a neat roll mechanic to avoid getting hit. The levels and enemy positions are randomly generated which at times can create issues, like when an ammo clip spawns near an entrance or an enemy spawns right on top of you. Between stages you can trade any dog tags you find for permanent upgrades to your character and these will stick with you even after losing a life. The bosses are often a sight to behold, but they're also extremely difficult and in my opinion not properly balanced. For example, I feel the first boss is more difficult than the ones in the following three levels, simply because you do not have any upgrades with you yet. Another big issue I have with the game isn't with the game itself, but rather the Mega Drive controller. To put it simply, it wasn't made for this style of game. It does not matter if I use a 3 button or 6 button controller, I can never get a hang of the controls. I don't have this issue with modern controllers, but here it always feels like I'm fighting the controls just as much as I do the aliens. This is an excellent game, but you might want to pick up the PlayStation or Steam ports instead. Core is a year or running gun by the same team who would go on to make the Battlefield series, and it is superb. Once again, you're a soldier sent to a military base that's been overrun. Man, there are a lot of these. But more importantly, I freaking love this game. Fast action, great platforming, really fun weapons, and one of the best soundtracks on the Mega Drive. The cool thing about this game is that it's not a simple affair of running from left to right, rather you need to explore the base for keys, buttons and switches. But each area is segmented in a way where you're never really lost nor do you waste too much time looking for whatever it is you need. Instead, the areas always feel like they are the exact size they need to be. Along the way, you'll find new weapons which, once added to your inventory, stay there forever and you'll be able to cycle between them, a feature which promotes exploration. Because trust me, you do not want to miss out on the spread gun or the rocket launcher. Though I should point out that every weapon except your main one has limited ammo, so beware. Each gun can be upgraded twice, which is yet another reason why you'd want to thoroughly explore these levels. And you'll even find computers which give you maps, request keycards or in some cases let you contact shops where you can buy health, lives and more ammo. Some levels do have areas that seem designed to drain you of your lives, but then again, the game is also fairly liberal in granting you more, and you usually continue where you left off. Though be warned, there's a good chance you will die a lot in this section in level 2. No joke, this is quite possibly the hardest bit in the entire game. I also don't get why you have so many missions indoors, when the outdoor levels look arguably better. That was an odd design choice, but honestly, these are very minute gripes in an otherwise excellent game. This one comes highly recommended. The Rias Extra version is not to be confused with the Rias on the Mega Drive Mini. Technically they are both the same game, but this extra version rebalances the game's difficulty to make it more accessible as well as adding a few other options not found on the Mega Drive Mini version. From a graphical and presentation standpoint, there's really nothing about this game that stands out. I mean. I think we can all agree that these visuals look fairly standard for the system, and while the music is good, it's also nothing outstanding. But where this game shines is the gameplay. To me, this is truly the best way to play the Rias. 
I own the arcade version of the Rias on the Nintendo Switch, but the thing is, the arcade version came on a 3 screen arcade board, and no matter how much I tried, I just could not get used to this on an HD television. But this port perfectly maintains the spirit of the game. The difficulty is perfectly balanced for a single screen while keeping the game intense, fun and addicting. I just love collecting the power-ups, choosing my optimal path at the end of each level and see all the different and unique bosses. To me, the Rias Extra version truly has become the definitive way of playing this game at home and I highly recommend it. From one visually unimpressive gang to another, Tenzer may not look like much at first glance. But don't let it fool you, this game is incredible. Tenzer can best be described as a mix of Strider and a shmup, and it is amazing. You run from left to right, defeating hordes of enemies while avoiding their bullet showers, and the game manages to do this while keeping a steady frame rate. Though you can improve the graphics a little bit at the cost of frame rate. But if you really want to become a master of this game, you're supposed to dance in the air. That is to say, defeat all your foes and reach the end without ever touching the ground. And in fact, the game rewards you by giving you extra points at the end of the stage depending on how many consecutive mid-air jumps you manage to perform. Not only that, but there's also these giant orbs which can only be destroyed by not touching the ground. And while I'm not sure, I think that breaking these is how you get the good ending. Between levels, you go to a shop where you can buy new abilities or upgrade said abilities. And these are very useful because they also destroy bullets, which becomes incredibly useful against bosses. Look, I get it. The enemy designs are weird and very early Commodore Amiga-like. But please, I beg you, give this game a chance. It's so good. It truly is an incredible game for the system. And for my number one game, my choice is Paprium. To say that this game is controversial is putting it mildly. I've actually received threats and accusations of selling out because of my previous positive review of this game. Yes, the development behind this game was pure chaos. Yes, Fonzie's behavior while making this game, the way he treated his staff and his loyal fanbase is shameful. The fact he went so long without paying his staff is unforgivable, and the fact that so many people who ordered and pre-ordered the game still haven't gotten it is appalling. And yes, I know and agree that the game should be available digitally, but regardless of its troubled history, when taken by itself, Paprium is my favorite modern game on the Sega Mega Drive. To me, this game is incredible. Graphically, it looks amazing for the system, and the soundtrack is one of the best the console has ever produced. The gameplay is not quite on the level of Streets of Rage, but Paprium makes up for its flaws with the sheer amount of content it has. For one thing, it does not just have a single campaign like every other beat-em-up. No, it has four, count them, four completely distinct campaigns with two additional ones. This means that if you finish one campaign, you can simply replay a different one and experience a completely different playthrough. The game also has at least 7 different playable characters, most of which need to be unlocked. And then you have what truly makes Paprium special, the original mode. Basically, this is a mode where you pick what path you want to take, similar to what you find in Capcom's arcade Dungeons & Dragons games. But once you finish a campaign, you need to set one of your characters to rule over that portion of the city, and they will in turn give you special missions. And all of this is required to unlock the game's various endings, extra content, and hidden features like the arena mode. All of that while giving you a gameplay that stands above the vast majority of 16-bit beat-em-ups. 
The truth is, there is no other Sega Genesis game that plays quite like Patreon does or has the sort of features and replay values this game does. Yes, you would be right to argue that Patreon does quantity over quality. But man, that's a lot of quantity. And the quality is still head and shoulders above a lot of classic beat-em-ups. If you want to criticize Fonz and Watermelon, I'll stand right beside you. But the game? Man, this game is just incredible. I just wish it were easy to get, as sadly, there's no digital version and any copies on eBay are, uh, yikes. And there you have it. My personal ranking for the best and worst modern Mega Drive games. Are there any games you disagree with? Let me know in the comments. In the meantime, I'd like to thank all my Patreon supporters, including my high-tier Patreon supporters like Anthony Ryan Bennett, Apple, Ben Herodine, Genru, Liquid Farts and Tomenza. Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Bye!